Hello, welcome back to the channel. You know, a while ago, I put out a bit of an ask for you guys to send in some questions about nightscape photography, uh, or about my workflow, or about me, or anything at all. So today, we're gonna go through that. So this is my very first Q&A video for 2022. I've got a lot of questions here which I'm gonna get through. So we better get snappy onto it. So here we go, first one. Hi Richard, your work's amazing. So thank you very much, especially your generous explanations of light painting foreground subjects. But I don't recall seeing how you develop the sky portion of your images. Could you do a short video on how you get such great texture and density in your Milky Way skies, please? Keep up the great work. That's from Darren Homewood. Well, Darren, look, just about every second video that I've produced, I go through a lot of the details of this question. Now, I do fully realize that sometimes, uh, I know a lot of you look at my videos and you don't know all of the library of videos. I've got about 170 odd videos, so it's pretty hard to find what you're looking for sometimes. But I can tell you that I've got some playlists on my channel and there's quite a lot that I go into the very nitty gritty of the post processing of how I get my Milky Way images to look the way that they do. So uh, I, t I, I Totally understand the question though, because it is sometimes very hard to find these. But Darren, I have got plenty of videos there already. Just search some of my playlists. That narrows it down to maybe five or six or seven videos that you can have a look at. Next question. Hi Richard, your videos are great and a source of inspiration. That's great. Could you include a few more single shot and light painting segments, please? And that's many thanks from Jeff Stone. Now Jeff, that's almost a similar question to the first one. Um, once again, I have done a fair few videos, although to be honest, uh, Jeff's question is more relating to single shot and light painting. And so you'll find in a lot of the videos that I produce, uh, I might do a complex multi-layer stacking image, uh, etc. But I often also put in a single shot just to give you an idea of what the difference is and what they look like. So uh, I take it on board, Jeff. I think I will do some more videos this year, just showing some simple workflows for single exposures. All right, next question. Since we don't have the Milky Way available until next year in the US, well, I think that's now this year, but anyway, What's the best technique or settings to photograph other nightscapes like nebulas or star constellations? And that's from Tato de Leon. Now, um, this is a good question because a lot of people say, well, Milky Way season is finished. What else is there to shoot in the night sky? Now I have produced, again, a number of videos on this topic as have other people. Alan Wallace has got some great uh, videos on this very topic as well. But you know, just recently, of course, I've been shooting the Orion Nebula, concentrating on that part of the sky, because here in Australia, that's a summer constellation, upside down to what you guys in the Northern Hemisphere are used to. But you know, we've also got down here in the Southern Hemisphere, we've got the, the Southern Cross and the Eta Carina Nebula, and there's lots of beautiful areas, Magellanic Clouds, all of which I feature a lot on this channel. And uh, for you guys in the Northern Hemisphere, you have other subjects that we don't see here. Um, then of course, there's auroras. Now, they can occur at any time of the year. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you can, you can throw all your plans out the window when there's an aurora happening. And that's happened to me a couple of times where the Milky Way's been there shining, but suddenly there's an aurora over here. I forget about the Milky Way because I'm, I'm fixed onto the aurora. I think the idea is to go looking for something different, but the question about the techniques, the techniques are pretty much exactly the same. It doesn't matter what you're shooting in the night sky. You still gotta limit your shutter speed unless you're using a star tracker, uh, and you have to be able to compose the foreground with the background. All of these things are exactly the same, whether it's the Milky Way that you're shooting or something else. Hi Richard, love your videos. Thank you. One question I always ask myself when I go out is how many photos should I take? Should I, should I take a hundred and hope there's one that turns out awesome? Or do I only take minimal photos and wait for that special one? So this is Paul from caravanning around Australia. That sounds like a pretty good thing to do, Paul. Um, so how many photos? Well, you know, I've always been a fairly minimalistic photographer. When I used to do weddings, I wasn't a guy who would shoot thousands and thousands of photos. I just shoot as many as I think I needed to cover that particular shot. And it's very much for me the same with nightscapes. Now, I know a lot of people shoot uh, more than I do because sometimes, yeah, you, you're not sure you've got the exposures right. But when it comes to shooting nightscapes, it's slow motion photography anyway. So 
Rarely are you going to be shooting hundreds of photographs in one session at night because the exposure shutter speeds are so long. Um, I hear what you're saying though, Paul, because sometimes it comes down to, I'm not sure what I'm doing, so I just got to take a whole lot of different settings. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I think that's a pretty good valid way of learning what your camera and your lens combination does for you. So maybe not hundreds, but certainly uh, just trial and error. There's nothing wrong with trial and error. But for me, I'm fairly minimalistic about it. Hi Richard, have you ever taken multiple exposures over multiple nights on a chosen target in order to improve the signal to noise ratio and produce a cleaner image in post? Is this something that you can cover in a future video from Tony Stevenson? Now Tony, I've never done that because that's more of a technique for a deep space photography where they have to gather up hours and hours and hours of data, as they call it, on a target. Now for me, shooting wide angle nightscapes it's not practical and not even needed to do that. So no, my answer is no. And because it's not something I, I consider myself an expert in, I'm probably not going to be doing a video to cover that, but it's still a valid question. Thanks for that. Hi again, Richard. Have you made any homemade light painting tools or rigs to help you get results? For example, fixing a flashlight to a fishing rod to get extra height or making flashlight attachments. That's from Graham Lang. Now, Graham, to be honest, I haven't really done much of that, but I know there's some guys out there that have, and I, I actually don't mind your idea of attaching a light to a, to a pole. I know a lot of guys who attach floodlights to painters' poles so that they can paint over the top of cars. And often when I've been out shooting and, and light painting the car, I've thought to myself, I wish I could get up higher. So I think it's a pretty valid point. But for me personally, the, the best I've ever done is stuck uh, a gel over the front of my torch as you can see here so that's not very scientific but <clears throat> anyway thanks Graham question for you mate what's your opinion on sky replacements if I shoot a foreground subject and the sky is lousy or cloud covered but wanted to use one of my own stock Milky Way shots as a sky replacement for where the core would have been if it was a clear sky I'd love to know your thoughts on this and thank you heaps as always keep up the great work cheers Nate well, thank, thanks heaps for the question, Nate. And this is a really good question. And I ask myself this question a lot, and I get asked this question a lot. And I know a lot of you probably ponder this. Um, my opinion is, is pretty much that if you, whatever you shoot is your own image, you can do what you want with it. I don't think it's fair for me or anybody else to sit here and say, well, you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that. Um, but I, I do have a few caveats with that. I think if you're going to, replace uh, a sky or put a Milky Way in where it wasn't there because of clouds or whatever, um, I think it's fair to say, especially if the alignment isn't right. For example, if there's a tree here, the Milky Way should be over there, but I'll put the Milky Way here. Um, it's, a lot of people may do that and no one would know the wiser. But I think, you know, if, if you're in a position where people are trying to learn nightscape photography, I think it's really important to actually explain, this is what I've done. It's not saying it's bad, it's not saying it's anything wrong with it, but this is what I've done. I've, that was cloudy, I had to replace, and there, you know, there's all sorts of uh, techniques and creative decisions that have to be made whenever you're post-processing images. So I, I have done it, and uh, I think it's a valid way of expressing your creative art. Nothing wrong with it at all. But I do probably advise people to actually just say, okay, this is what I did. And I would probably also, on that topic, I would probably prefer to line up the subject with a correct placement of the Milky Way. So in other words, if the Milky Way is over here and the tree's there, then I get on the other side of the tree and shoot it that way. I mean, that's not very hard to do. And I think, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, there's a valid uh, way of doing it and there's nothing wrong with that. Hi Richard, could you go over the editing of your fine art light painting foreground shots? How you, how you load up files to Photoshop in layers and blend multiple photos together. I find that to be an amazing skill, and that's from Sean Muller. Well, Sean, thanks for that. Look, once again, I've got, I've got countless videos where I go through the editing of these images, but I do get your point because it's far more than just editing because there's a fine balancing act between shooting in the field and editing those images. And I've said this many times before, I think the key to getting a great photograph is to shoot in the field 
with always having your editing of that image in mind so that I know what I'm going to do with that image. And you know, that impacts on the settings that we have, our apertures and shutter speeds and the amount of light that we use. So when I'm out in the field, that's when my creative um, energy is really flowing. When I get back into the edit suite, uh, sure, that, that's creative as well, but all I'm really doing is collecting and putting together those images that I've already captured in the field. Because as you well know, if you capture rubbish, then it's really hard to edit rubbish and make it look fantastic. So, um, but once again, I've got heaps of videos on this. And again, I've got quite a few playlists where you can go through step by step by step by step. And hopefully that helps. Hi Richard, if you're shooting a time lapse at a cold location, how do you prevent your camera batteries from discharging at high speed before completing the time lapse? Regards from Costa Rica, Adrian uh, Pic Picado. Thanks, Adrian. This is a really good question. Uh, it's one of the things I love the most about this camera. This is the Nikon Z6 Mark II. And the reason I love it is because you can connect up a battery. I've got a couple of them here. Just a standard old USB power bank via a USB-C cable. And I can power the camera all night and it doesn't matter how cold it gets. The other thing I can do is use the same type of batteries. And I've got a few different ones here. There's a little one there, same thing. It'll power up the camera or a lens warmer. And so I've got plenty of these things and I'll put them in these little bags and hang them over my tripod uh, hook somewhere so that they're, they're not in the way because I fully understand that the more stuff you put hanging off your camera tripod, uh, the more things that there are to bump and carry on. Uh, so that's my secret and it works really well for me. Okay, what torch do you use for light painting and what do you modify it with if anything i use low level lighting myself but interested to try light painting now and again christine krebs Th thanks christine i use this trusted little lead lenser p7 torch and it's got a half cto gel taped over the front and this is a torch that i've used for years i've got a few other different types as well they're all good uh, probably you can use anything like i know people that use their phone I've also got all sorts of little lights I've been experimenting with, such as these Ulanzi ones. This is a new one, little magnetic light. This is an aluminium table, so it's not working, um, but you get my drift. It's fantastic little light. Here's another one, little plastic one. The good thing about these is, I don't, that you probably can't see that, but these are color changeable. So it's a full RGB color. So I can change, but they're still, these ones are more of a floodlight, more of a low level light, a bit like you're talking about. I just use a flashlight, just a standard torch, and I emphasize the fact that I have one that is zoomable. So I can zoom in and light paint a smaller area and contain the light beam. So that's what I use. From Brad, is Astro modding a camera for, for nightscape and astrophotography really worth it? I've contemplated doing so for a while now. And I noticed you always seem to track with your Astro modded camera. So it's amazing how you folks really take notice of what I'm doing. So that's good. Does it not perform or get the desired results with shorter exposures, say 20 seconds with a 20 mil lens? Okay, so there's a couple of things there. Is, is Astro modding a camera really worth it? Um, in the long run, I would say, if you've only got one camera, so if I just had this one Z6 Mark II, I would not Astro mod it because when you do that, you lose other capabilities because it messes up with the white balance and you try to shoot this camera in the daytime with an Astro mod, it's a pain in the neck. So, um, but I've got three Nikon Z6s and one of them is Astro H Alpha, Hydrogen Alpha Astro Modified. Um, it took me ages to work out the white balance and the, and the way to edit the file. So it's not something I would suggest everybody does. And not only that, some of my best, in fact, most of my best Milky Way images are taken with a standard camera, not an Astro mod. In fact, this Z6 II, I keep raving about this camera, but the color and the images out of that are just fantastic. You can get a, a reasonable amount of the, the red colored hydrogen alpha anyway. So, um, oh, and the other part of the question is, um, Brad's noticed that I usually use it on a tracker and that's very true and the reason for that is because I'm tending to shoot subjects like Orion that has got a lot of hydrogen alpha around that constellation and other other places so um, 
if I'm needing to shoot Orion, say with a 35mm lens or something like that, I need to get as much as I can. And the only way I can really do that is with a tracker, so I need longer shutter speeds. So I might shoot 10, 15 or 20 uh, two minute shutter speeds at a lower ISO, at ISO 800 or thereabouts, at f2.8, that's pretty much my go-to settings. Um, and then I stack those. And by stacking them, I'm getting a much cleaner image. And because I'm taking all of that time, then it's a, it's a more detailed image. So sure, you can shoot uh, smaller shutter speeds at 20 seconds, 30 seconds, but I prefer longer if I'm using a tracker. Okay, let's move on. I'd be interested to hear how you go about filming your videos in the field and what gear you use for this. Also, oh, this is, this is good. Also, do you have a recipe for those rum balls? So this is from David Gleistein. Look, David, I have no idea what goes in rum balls. All I know is whether I like them or not. I'm guessing there's rum, but apart from that, I have no idea. The, the place that is my favorite rum ball shop, uh, I asked the guy, the, the baker, the guy who makes them, and he said, oh, he, he, he said, it's a secret herbs and spices. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I don't care what's in it. I just love them. So filming myself. About 18 months ago, I bought a Sony a7S III, which is the camera that's filming me now. I used to use a Panasonic G9. Great camera in the daytime, autofocus, dodgy. The Sony a7S III is fantastic for shooting in low light levels, and that's what I wanted in my camera. So you've seen a lot of my images where I'm running around in the middle of the dark, there's no hardly any lights around, and you can see the stars, and you can see me, you can see what I'm doing. Now to do that, even though the a7S III is a fantastic camera, it still needs a really good lens. So I've got two here. This is a Sony 24mm f 1.4 G Master. Awesome lens, absolutely awesome. And also the Sony 20mm f 1.8. Now I used to use this one the most for my filming. Now I nearly exclusively use this one because it's a bit faster aperture. It lets a bit more light, a little bit less uh, VIG netting and things like that. Both awesome lenses, uh, but I can't emphasize enough, you need a very fast aperture lens if you're shooting these night videos. Let's face it, you can shoot with any camera in the daytime. You can use a phone, you can use whatever, doesn't matter. But for the stuff I want to do, I need that A7S III. I'm going to go through that this year sometime. I'll make a video just talking about all of my gear that I use. Okay, Astro and Nightscape Photography are similar yet have their own differences. Yes, that's true. Would a, a, a baton of mask, as used within Astro, be helpful for focusing within wide-angle nightscape applications? Uh, light pollution hacks for those who live with Bortle Plus areas. This is from uh, Derek Rowan. Thanks, Darren. Well, well uh, Derek, sorry. One thing I can say is I don't have light pollution hacks. And the reason for that is because I live in an in a area that's not light polluted. So I don't shoot in heavy light pollution ever, never, because I don't have to. Uh, and I know for some of you, you, you don't have that option, but I do. So I guess I'm just being honest. I, I don't have, haven't spent hours and hours and hours trying to work out how to get rid of light pollution because it's not a major issue for me. Now, as far as a Batonov mask, um, I've never used one because I've never seen the need to use one. I find focusing with these wide angle lenses um, as long as they're fast aperture lenses is pretty straightforward after a while it does take a bit of practice from what i understand a batonov mask is more useful at longer focal lengths and they're typically used in telescopes which is where this question has originated from um, good question though because a lot of people ask that question hi richard hope you're doing well what do you recommend as a good exposure for the milky way i've been exposing with the histogram coming across halfway from the left and when reviewing the image and checking the histogram um, that's from John Carter. So it's a, it's a really good question. Now, one thing I would say, John, is for me personally, uh, I don't rely on the histogram in my night photos. Now it's different if you're shooting daytime landscapes and all sorts of things like that, all things being considered, the histogram is a great tool for getting your exposure where you want it to be. When it comes to nightscapes, um, for me, I think that it's a little bit uh, misleading because the histogram only captures the light pixels properly or in the camera so the histogram is only showing whatever you have so in other words the sky but for me half of my uh, nightscapes uh, are in darkness because the foreground isn't lit so the histogram is sort of pushed over towards the left um, so the other thing that comes into this is ISO invariance and um, a lot of people will recommend actually underexposing in camera 
so that you maintain your dynamic range and you don't blow any highlights and all of those things. Now, uh, the only way you can really check all of this is to trial and error. I've, I've talked about this a lot in the past, but some cameras don't have ISO invariant sensors and a lot of the Canon cameras don't, especially the older ones. So you, you do tend to have to expose them a bit more in camera to get the best noise performance. Whereas with my Nikon cameras and most of the Sony cameras, um, you can certainly underexpose. In fact, there's probably a sweet spot there. It may be uh, 800 to 1600 ISO. But the problem with that is, and which is why I don't do it most of the time, is because if you underexpose everything in camera and you're checking your, your images on the back of the screen, you can't see the detail properly. You have to wait till you get to your uh, post-processing, like Lightroom or Photoshop, and boost the signal. And then you might think, oh, hang on, I've, I've exposed it incorrectly. It's out of focus or something like that. I'd prefer to use medium high ISOs in camera and that by definition pushes that histogram across anyway. Hopefully that's helpful. Hi Richard, I'm keen to understand what I may believe is a change in your workflow that I've picked up in a couple of your last videos. You, you've had a tracked image, ambient sky and foreground images. The ambient one is the shot I'm trying to understand. Tracked sky, dropped in, foreground sky added as normal. Um, and the use of the ambient in the workflow with a question mark. Not sure if I've missed something. Thanks in advance. This is from Alan Broomby. Thanks, Alan. Uh, I've been asked this question so many times and I probably should have explained it better. Um, essentially, I use what I call an ambient sky exposure when I'm using a star tracker. And the reason I do that is because I tend to be typically using the Photoshop sky replacement algorithm to put my tracked skies behind my foregrounds. Now, if you've ever tried to use a sky replacement uh, algorithm, you'll know that it needs a sky to replace. So what I do, uh, besides the light painting foreground shots, I take an ambient exposure of just a single shot of the sky with stars, with no light painting. And that's what I classify as my ambient light. And that's the one that the software uses to replace the sky. Now, if you've never used the sky replacement algorithm, you might know what I'm talking about, but that's the reason I do it. Hope that helps, um, Alan. Next question. Hi, Richard. Mine is about noisy night photos. I get nice sharp images, but the noise makes the photos unusable in any decent size. They're fine for Facebook, but not to a standard I'm happy with. I shoot with a Canon D70. I think he means a 70D. And he's got an EOS R f1.8 11-14 to lens. That's from Jeff Holmes. Now, Jeff, this is a question that everyone faces at some stage, usually at the beginning of their nightscape journey, and it never really leaves all the way through. My big advice to you, if you're having trouble with noise, is to stack for noise reduction. Take more than one image, take six, eight, 10, 15 images of the same thing, put them into a program like Sequator and stack them. That will reduce the noise dramatically, and you'll find a big improvement in your images. You've probably seen some of the images that I've printed, massive sizes, and they're just taken with a, a standard 24 megapixel camera, similar to what you've got. Hi Richard, how do you find the mirrorless cameras compared to DSLR cameras when it comes to quality of images? Do you miss the old DSLR cameras? I know new technologies are fantastic with mirrorless cameras, but I much prefer at this moment in time my Nikon D810. It's hard work, but enjoy the challenge. Do you still use your D750? And that's from Royston Palmer. Thanks, Royston. Um, well, I don't have any D750s anymore. I've sold them. That's why I've got the three Z6s. Um, but the, the, the heart of this question is, is there a, a difference in image quality? And I would have to say, not really, no. I think the DSLR cameras are fantastic image quality, such as your D810. Um, but I think what it comes down to is other factors, usability ergonomics, features, things that are built into the camera. Now, one thing I can tell you that I would never ever live without is a tilting or flip screen. Now, the Nikon D810 doesn't have that. Now, I find myself on very low angles many, many times uh, when I'm shooting my nightscapes, and I couldn't possibly survive with a camera that I have to get down there. My, my back and my neck and my knees, everything else hurts already. So uh, that's, that's my main reason. But as far as image quality, no. I don't think they're any better at this stage. Hi Richard, I was looking for those cameras, uh, Nikon Z6 versus the Z6 Mark II. He watched my video about the Z6. 
Is there something very special with the Z6 II? This is from Kleber uh, Cavill Hero. Thanks, Kleber. Um, there's a few things really special about the Z6 Mark II. Uh, the first thing is the USB charging I mentioned before about the time lapse. Fantastic. Now, a lot of other cameras have this feature, by the way. The, the Sony A7S III has the same feature, but the Z6 Mark I, the original one, didn't have that feature. Another thing that the Z6 Mark II has, and this is something that a lot of you will say, oh, I couldn't care less about that, but I tell you what, it is fantastic when you're taking long uh, shots on the tracker, and that is extended shutter speeds. I can go beyond 30 seconds in camera. 60 seconds, 90 seconds, two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, 15 minutes. I can do long shutter speeds just like I can do short shutter speeds. And I love that about this camera. Apart from that, they're, they're pretty much the same. The image quality is no different. How did you decide that your niche is in astrophotography? Um, what advice would you give in finding one's niche? Wow, this is a good question. Uh, this is from uh, Pooja uh, Fazi Allegan. Sorry if I butchered that name, I'm very sorry, but you're a good supporter of my channel and I thank you for the question. Uh, my simple answer to that is to follow your heart. What is your passion? What do you love doing? For me, ever since I was this big, I loved watching the night sky. I love the stars. I love being out at night. I love just the atmosphere. I love the quiet. I love the peace and the tranquility. That's my passion. Now, I've also got a passion for photography and a passion for video production. So put all of that together and you end up with nightscape images. For me, it's a no brainer. Now it took a long time for the technology to catch up with my passion. So when I was a young kid, I just tried my best, but it was no good. And, and even probably 10 years ago, my images wouldn't have been very good. But the technology, the cameras, the lenses and everything else has caught up with that. And now it's much, much easier. Follow your heart. Your heart tells you your passion. Whatever it is you love to do, do that. What was your job before you became a full-time photographer? This is from Sergey Farlik. Well, Sergey, um, when I left school, I didn't have any particular training in anything. I didn't go to university. Uh, so I, I went into automotive spare parts initially. And so I became a spare parts guy. I was in the automotive industry. I didn't know anything about cars. Uh, I learned very quickly about cars because I couldn't do the job without learning a bit. Um, so that's what I did. But you know, it didn't take long from my passion, getting back to the other question, my passion started to show through. And there were things that people were getting me to do jobs on the weekends, photography jobs, video production jobs, and music, and all sorts of things like that. And um, about 21 years ago this year, uh, I took the plunge and left my full-time job and started working full-time. And I didn't just do photography because I, I, I was mowing lawns, I was teaching music in schools, um, I had le private lessons at home teaching guitar to students and I was photographing weddings and, or videotaping weddings on weekends. So I, I took a leap of faith, jumped out of the boat, so to speak, that's what I did. Hey Richard, I'd like to know what your holy grail image is. <laughs> the place you would most desperately like to visit and capture a nightscape image. This is from my good friend Craig Richards down at Warrnambool. Well Craig, um, you know, I, I honestly don't have one. Uh, I would love to go to Iceland or somewhere like that that is completely different to what I have here in Australia. But having said that, um, New Zealand, I, I just love Tasmania and I know uh, New Zealand is like Tasmania on steroids. So I'd like to go there. Um, there's probably places in the, in the United States and Canada, the Rocky Mountains sound absolutely beautiful. But you know, one thing I don't like is hordes and hordes of people. So I prefer to go to somewhere where there's no one else. And I don't know if that's in Canada, but uh, anyway, it's a good question. Um, I've got one more question. So we're just about to finish up and this is a good one. What is the one thing that is most important when considering shooting nightscape photography? And this is from Rose Holt. One thing, gee, that's a hard one. So what, what would I say about that? Would I say focusing? Because focusing is pretty hard. Um, if you can't focus your camera in the dark, you'll never get shots that, you, that you're happy with. You know, uh, commitment, dedication, you've got to have that in bucket loads, to be honest. You really do. One thing, it's really hard just to say one thing. What, what I'd probably do suggest is, that, is to try and separate the, the, the concept of a final image from the enjoyment of the hunt 
to get that image. In other words, enjoy the, the journey along the way. There's so many twists and turns. There's, there's highs and there's lows in nightscape photography. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. In fact, it's probably one of the most difficult genres of photography that you'll ever encounter. But I, I, I think that looking back on my journey, I would say I've enjoyed the learning process. I've enjoyed going from here to here. You don't go from here to here in one step. It just doesn't work that way. You just have little increments along the way. And you've got to give your time, yourself time to develop in your craft. You just have to. It doesn't happen bang overnight. You've got to give yourself time. That's why I often mention trial and error. Trial and error is the learning process. And the more trial you do, and the more error you encounter, the more success you will eventually have. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty hard to put that into words, but you know, the other thing is don't compare yourself to anyone. There's always people who are further down the track who produce fantastic images and you think, I will never be able to do that. Well, the reality is, yes, you will. You can do whatever you set your mind to, set your heart to it, you can do it. You have to believe, you have to have a little bit of faith in your own abilities and your own methods because eventually, with that trial and error, eventually you will get there. So the other thing I would say is to, is to go back to shooting basics every now and then. You know, sometimes we get too far in front of ourselves and we try to, to, to bite off more than we can chew. We try to do the hard stuff before we've actually got over some of the basic steps along the way. And I've done this heaps of times and there's occasions where I'll go out uh, just at the end of last year, I went out and shot some single exposure photos and really enjoyed myself and thought, man, this is just brings it right back to that very first time when I went out to start to shoot. And it makes me feel so much better about where I'm at now and looking and enjoying just the experience of being out there. So anyway, I, I guess it's a matter of rediscovering the passion. And I think that's where this begins and that's where it ends. All right, well, that's it. We're finished. You've stuck with me this long. Look, I appreciate it so much. Uh, I'll, I'll be out with some more videos. I'm recording all, all the time. I appreciate you looking. If you want to subscribe to the channel, I would love to have you on board. If you want to give this a thumbs up and a like, comments down below in the comments section. Always love reading those and I try to respond to every single comment. All right, until next time, I'll see you guys later.